have this to say about the Suez Canal crisis. It has been the belief of our association from the beginning that the Suez crisis ought to have been referred to the United Nations. That certainly we oughtn't get into World War number three in the Near East over the Suez Canal. It's interesting that the, uh, for instance, the British government, the Eden government, uh, was, was threatening the use of force in the early stages at least. Uh, but the little fellow on the street, the men and women, women like ourselves in Great Britain, uh, were very critical of using military force on the Suez crisis. And would you, would you believe that in a poll of public opinion, the Gallup poll in Great Britain shows that 82%, 82% of the British people say that the Suez crisis ought to be referred to the United Nations. That's how you build this United Nations by using the machinery that's, it's, uh, that is provided. So we think that uh, the Suez crisis ought to be referred first to the world court. Uh, does uh, Egypt have the right to nationalize the Suez Canal in consideration of the Constantinople Treaty of 1888? And then uh, we think there ought to be an international waterways commission that ought to set up some rules and regulations so all nations of the world would have free access under equal condition, uh, conditions to waterways such as the Suez Canal, uh, the Panama Canal, uh, and other uh, great waterways. And uh, it's interesting because I, I just read it recently that the League of Nations had some ideas on this subject and they had <coughs> what is called the Barcelona Treaty <coughs> written way back in 1921 referring to international waterways, and there are 21 nations of the world that signed this Barcelona Treaty uh, referring to certain rules and regulations, free access to international waterways by uh, the, the, all the nations of the world. <coughs> now, as we think of the great issues today before the world, we say first, there's the issue of atoms for peace. We've talked mostly about atoms for war, and I think President Eisenhower has done a good job in, uh, in bringing the attention of the world toward atoms for peace. He uh, appeared before the assembly back in 1953, suggested an atoms for peace program. A year ago, we had the greatest conference of scientists in the world's history at Geneva, about 1,200 of the great scientific minds, and they discussed uh, atomic energy. <coughs> and the interesting point, ladies and gentlemen, is that we didn't have all the the information we thought we had, uh, at least a monopoly on atoms for peace or war, uh, most of the scientific facts were known the world over. And you know, the, the greatest international citizen is really the scientist because there are no iron curtains on science. It's uh, a, a worldwide uh, uh, profession, the, the scientific uh, industry. Many great things were said at Geneva. I give you just one or two. The first that one million, that one pound of coal, uh, or I should say one, one pound of uranium is equal to a million pounds of coal. And then there was this statement by the delegate from India. He said that if India had the same high standard of living that we have in the United States for just 10 years, that India would exhaust all her power resources. If India had our standard of living for just 10 years, India would exhaust all her power resources. Now think how important that atoms for peace, atomic energy, is going to be. I was interested in a statement by Senator Humphrey just recently in Minneapolis, a meeting I attended. He said that <clears throat> the reason that Great Britain, for instance, set 1968 as the year when they were agreeable to Egypt nationalizing the Suez Canal is that by 1968, Great Britain feels that she will have atomic energy developed to such an extent that Great Britain won't have to worry by 1968, whether they have this, uh, the, the Suez Canal open or not. So uh, while there are many reasons why the United States has this tremendously high standard of living, certainly uh, power of coal and oil is one of the great uh, reasons here in America uh, for our high uh, standard of living. Now it's interesting, the importance of the United Nations, you talk about atoms for peace, because the atomic powers like the United States thought that we'll set up this Atoms for Peace program, and uh, we won't let the other nations of the world uh, say much about it, uh, have much control. Uh, but it was brought up last year at the assembly meeting in New York. Now, there is a steering committee. I suppose there are a couple of hundred items that are suggested for discussion in this approximately three months period. And then there are generally about 70 items selected. 
Well, if you were the assembly and you had to talk about 70 items in, in three months, you just couldn't do it if you worked day and night. So, like all uh, uh, legislative bodies, uh, uh, for instance, like our state uh, legislature or our national legislature, uh, we divide up into committees. And so we have the political committee, the social committee, economic committee, trusteeship committee, legal committee, and budgetary and administrative. And so the political committee uh, had this question of atoms for peace. And so if you represented one of these little nations uh, around the world, this is what you said. You said, just a moment now, before these atomic powers set up the Atoms for Peace program, we want to have something to say about it. We want to discuss it. And so everyone had an opportunity to give his version of how an atomic agency should be set up under the United Nations. And it finally developed. There was, there was a meeting set in Washington in uh, January and February. And uh, now in general, the atomic agency will be, be uh, directed by, by three general groups. The first are the atomic powers, like ourselves, Great Britain, France, and Russia, Canada. Uh, and next, the secondary powers that, that wouldn't qualify like the first for atomic resources. And the third group will be those powers without any atomic resources whatever. And now, right now in New York, uh, I, I, I know this very intimately because the, the Medical Association in Minnesota wanted Dr. Bunch to come out the latter part of October to speak. So I called Ralph Bunch, and uh, he said, boy, I would like to come to Minnesota. I like it out there. But he said, I'm in charge of a meeting in setting up the atomic energy program. There are 84 nations that it will be in New York, and they're in New York now. There has been a constitution written, and these 84 nations now are going over this constitution for atomic energy. Uh, sentence by sentence and paragraph by paragraph, and out of this meeting now, under the direction of Ralph Bunch, who is now the Under Secretary General, will come the, the uh, movement uh, for Atoms for Peace and the, the Constitution and the framework and the uh, uh, foundation. The next important issue is that of colonialism. And if I said to you that colonialism is dead in the world, I'm sure you're not going to challenge that statement because it's as true uh, as we're sitting here today. And when you think of the history of the world and think that the United Nations now is not quite 11 years old and think of what has happened, I think you can see the importance of the UN. In, in just the last 10 years, here are the new nations that have now become independent. There's uh, Israel and India and Pakistan and Burma and Ceylon and Indonesia and the Philippines. That represents about 500 million people that's about one-fourth of the population of the world has become independent, think of it, have become new nations just in 10 years. And then uh, there has been a revolution in China. It's not the kind of a government which we like in the United States, the communist government, but it's, it's certainly a revolutionary government and a new government. And uh, it looks as though it's here to stay, uh, at least as far as we can see at the moment. And if you would add China, you would have about a billion people about half the population of the world, think of it, is living under a new form of government in just 10 years. Now we have a, a program in the United Nations, in the Charter, all of the nations with colonial areas. For instance, today, there are about 170 million people still living under colonialism. But all of the nations, like Britain and France, have agreed to bring these areas along toward self-government or independence. Then there are some League of Nations mandates areas, about 17 million people there. And uh, they are being brought along toward self-government. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, there are missions which go out and visit these areas. Uh, there are reports that come in. There are petitions. Uh, and so uh, we, we have a contact with the trusteeship areas uh, through the UN. And you know, it's very interesting because we've had visiting delegations, for instance, from Tanganyika in, in Central Africa. These people in their tribal costumes come to the United Nations and they make complaints. And one of the complaints they made was that, uh, that some of them lived on the boundary and Britain had one side of the boundary and, and France the other. And they said there were too many restrictions that Britain and France had on the boundary that made it difficult to live. Uh, so uh, much is going forward in the colonial areas. Then there's the issue of uh, disarmament. Uh, uh, we've had a great many meetings on disarmament. Uh, we have a subcommittee in the United Nations. Uh, we've wrestled with the problem now for 10 years. 
You know, ladies and gentlemen, that we are spending in the world today about $100 billion for disarmament or for armaments. In uh, the United States, we spend about $35 billion for our Army, Navy, and Air Force. That's about $200 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. Now, I'm not here to say we ought to spend less. Maybe, actually, we ought to spend more because uh, armaments provide us with defense. I, I look upon a good Army, Navy, and Air Force today as a holding process, but I see that the, the building of the peace has to go forward uh, under the, uh, the United Nations. So mainly what the Western world has been asking for is first of all a census of the arms and then uh, an agreement uh, to lower the Army, Navy, and Air Force and all the nations and then a, a plan of inspection. Now, Russia so far hasn't wanted United Nations inspectors back of the Iron Curtain. There are many reasons perhaps why that's so, but uh, we think one of the reasons is they don't want the Russian people to, to think there are, that there's any greater power than the USSR uh, government. But it seems to me that as long as the United Nations is wrestling with this problem of uh, disarmament, that uh, at least we can feel that something is being done and we never know when a break can take place. At our last conference in Washington, we had uh, Harold Stassen, who is President Eisenhower's uh, personal representative on disarmament. Mr. Stassen made the statement that he believes that it has seeped into the minds of the Russians that atomic war would be mutual suicide. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that there are changes taking place in Russia, uh, the easing of the restrictions on the satellites, the trouble that Khrushchev now finds himself in apparently, the recent meeting with Tito, uh, all that seems to be to, to mean some change in Russia. But if they do realize atomic war would be mutual suicide, it seems to me uh, we're moving a little along the lines uh, for a peaceful world. Uh, Senator Humphrey uh, uh, made a great deal of this thought. Hubert said that if we can, can raise the standards of living around the world and help people to have a, a better life, better education, better food, uh, more hope for themselves and their children, that, that he feels that we'll be building a climate of opinion that will, uh, will help uh, make a more peaceful world. Then there's the issue of collective security, and that means working together to maintain the peace. Now, we use military force in Korea, but that should always be a last resort, and we hope that it will not have to be used again. Uh, mainly, we have to rely on conference and uh, conciliation, arbitration, sitting around the conference table, and that's why we think, for instance, on this Suez Canal crisis, that, that threats of peace are not good, that uh, mainly public opinion has to be so strong that, that the Egypt and France and Britain uh, and the other important users of the Suez Canal, that we have to sit around the conference table and somehow uh, solve this problem re without resort to force or even the threat of force. And I, I see great hope as the United Nations becoming a better mediator of these uh, problems and struggles uh, between nations of the world. Uh, we have them, for instance, in, in labor and management. Think of the strikes we've had. For instance, we have labor conciliators in, in our states. We have them in our federal government. And these labor conciliators bring about peace between labor and management. And that's the sort of, of role which the United Nations has to carry out in the program of collective security. Then we have the other great issue of technical assistance. Uh, uh, John Eklund talked about your program of of building a better world. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, you don't challenge me if I say we have annihilated space. Today, you go across.